Now, my first guest this evening is one of the most honorable and most courageous men I've ever met. I have many political disagreements with him, but his integrity, his honor, and his courage have never, ever been in doubt. I've thought that from the moment uh, that the Labour Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, sacked him as Britain's ambassador to Uzbekistan, and I quote from the sacking letter, over-focusing on human rights. Yes, that's the people trying to boycott other people all over the world in the name of human rights. They sacked my next guest for over-focusing on human rights. I then worked with them very closely in the run-up to and in the aftermath of the disastrous invasion and occupation of Iraq. I never had any cause to doubt his integrity in his reportage of the crucifixion of Julian Assange. Indeed, he was virtually the only writer, the only British writer anyway, who was almost religiously reporting the actual facts in the trial, the persecution, the metaphorical crucifixion of the world historic publisher and journalist Julian Assange. And so I could automatically rely on his reportage of the trial of the framed Alex Salmond, a man who was set up by his own former colleagues, but who was acquitted on every single count by the good sense of a Scottish jury. Moreover, a Scottish jury with a majority of women. Perhaps for all of these reasons, my next guest was sent to a Scottish prison as a civil prisoner and has only just emerged. Not blinking into the light, but roaring into the microphone, his defiance and his determination to continue the fights that he has been engaged in so honorably over these last decades. He is, of course, the former British ambassador, the honorable, very honorable, Craig Murray, and he joins me now. Craig, I think I speak for everyone when I say welcome back uh, into uh, the light of freedom. And I think I speak for everyone uh, when I ask you the first question, which is, how was it behind bars? Well, thank you, George. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to see you. It's an even greater pleasure today. Um, it's very unpleasant. Uh, it's quite extraordinarily Victorian and, you know, old-fashioned repressive. I was held in a cell for a minimum of uh, 22 hours a day. And for a period of about a month, I was held in that cell for 23 and a half hours a day. And we're talking of a cell that's 12 feet by 8 feet. Um, and prison is, is governed by an extraordinary set of, of rules uh, <laughs> which seem designed to make it as unpleasant as possible. And just to give you one uh, trivial example, but, but it, it's typical really of, of the experience, uh, there are complicated rules as to what you are allowed to put on your walls by way of posters and cards as in, you know, where you can't show any exposed nipples or, 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 or really complex rules as to what you can put up. Um, but then you are not allowed to have drawing pins, sellotape or blue tack. Uh, and it is not allowed to put things up with anything else because that would damage your walls. So in fact, you aren't allowed to put anything at all on, 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 on the walls of yourself. Uh, and I just give that as a, as I say, it's a trivial example, but these are the sort of things that make life so very, very unpleasant on a day-to-day -day basis. 
uh, for the people in there. What did you do in that cell for 22 hours a day? A man like you, an intellectual, with all your books behind you, a man that has, if you'll forgive me, known the cocktail circuits of the foreign office, a man that's traveled the world. Now you're locked up for 22, for a month, 23 and a half hours a day. What, how could you possibly fill that time? Well, um, I was permitted books. In, in fact, there's a, there's a special dispensation. Uh, I was allowed to have books which were sent in by people, which is not normally allowed. Um, on condition that they were donated to the prison library and I borrowed them. And, and that was done especially for me. So I was able to read a great deal. If I, if I hadn't been able to do that, uh, then my life would have been intolerable. And, and remember, that, that was especially for me because I was a civil prisoner. The lives of many criminal prisoners are in, 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 intolerable. Um, uh, so I, you know, I was able to actually study uh, a great deal and um, and to catch up on on if you like some strands of modern thinking that I've not really looked into before so I read up heavily on uh, modern monetary theory I read heavily on critical race theory I you know I, I, I took a chance to um, to expand my intellectual horizons a little bit you see this is what I said last week uh, with dr. Deepa driver talking about your case not only was this a wicked and cruel imprisonment to which you were sentenced, it was also an extremely stupid one. Because I said to Dr. Deepa, and I put to you now, you've got one hell of a book in you now. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's true. I'm not sure I should write a book specifically about my prison experience, because that would be rather self-centered, if you like. Um, but... What I've learned about social justice and the lack of social justice in, in, in the UK um, has been fascinating. I mean, what I learned most was from conversations in, in the very brief periods per day I was allowed with other prisoners. And the vast majority of people in jail should not be there. The vast majority of them are, are suffering from addiction and they they may have committed crime in order to feed their addiction, but it's the addiction which is the, uh, which, which is the base problem. And the vast majority of criminals are, are born into the poorest and most deprived households, are, are born into crime in, in a sense, are certainly born into extreme poverty, and they're failed by social and educational policies. A great many of them, uh, an extraordinarily high proportion have been in institutions of one kind and another ever since childhood, you know, including foster care, young offenders institutions. Um, uh, very many of them have suffered from uh, sexual or physical abuse within those institutions. Uh, we, you know, we are failing uh, people in our society who are written off effectively from birth. And then the results of that, we are simply locking away in appalling conditions in which you wouldn't keep a dog uh, and locking them away. Not really, nothing really happens in terms of education or rehabilitation in jail. You know, it's all a pretense and a myth. Uh, and uh, the things I learned shocked me. They, 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 they really did. I, I know like most middle-class people, perhaps I, I make assumptions about our society uh, and how it is for people at the bottom of society, uh, you know, which are overly optimistic. I, I, I know a very great deal more now. How did the other prisoners, not that they could see you much, but how, how much interface did you have with the other prisoners? I mean, when you were out in the yard, were there other people there? How did the other uh, inmates treat you? Sometimes there were a few other people in the yard with me, people who were um, on remand. Um, uh, and sometimes I was alone. Um, I, I mean, the way I was treated was really quite extraordinary. You would have thought I was uh, Rudolf Hess. You know, it's, <laughs> there were times when I was walking around the exercise yard on my own with four prison officers watching me, which, which seemed to me, uh, you know, just absolutely crazy. But when I did talk with other prisoners, I, I can say I didn't, on what I never, 
ever encountered any hostility from a, from a fellow prisoner. They were all extremely polite to me. I was able to, um, to, to help some occasionally with, with advice on their case or, um, you know, a surprisingly high proportion of, of people in jail are, are illiterate or at least not confident reading and writing. And I was able to help people fill in forms and, uh, uh, and that kind of thing. But they, they all accepted me as they found me, if you like, as a, as a friendly and helpful person. And there was a surprising amount of knowledge had percolated into the jail as to who I was and why I was there. And so obviously there's a great deal of, of sympathy from the prisoners at having a, a political prisoner within their midst. But they were very, very supportive of me. I, uh, I have a long association with uh, the Prison Officers Association. Uh, and I, I, it's with some trepidation uh, that I ask you this next question. How did the prison staff relate to you? Um, very well. Uh, I, I'm, you, you need have no trepidation because people may be surprised to hear I was very impressed by the prison officers. And not only in the way they related to me, but in the way they related to, to ordinary criminal prisoners as well. I, I saw a very great deal of patience and kindness from prison officers. Of course, they're not all perfect. I'm not claiming it all perfect. But in general, I thought that they do a fantastic job in trying to keep together a system, uh, you know, a hopeless system, where people are, are churned through again and again and again. People coming back to prison for the eighth or ninth time, kept in appalling conditions, massive overcrowding, a feeling of hopelessness. Um, and it's not the fault of the prison officers. They didn't invent or design the system. They really have no say in the policies. They, they have to try to make it work. And I, I saw um, dedicated and kind people. I, 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 was, I wasn't expecting prison officers to be like that. I was actually expecting uh, them to be quite unpleasant and nasty and sharp and formal, um, authoritarian, if, if you like. And I really didn't see any of those things. I, I, I saw a very great deal of kindness and care from prison officers, and it did surprise me. I absolutely was not expecting to see that. So when they uh, incredibly uh, tried to handcuff you uh, to make a hospital visit, uh, they were doing that because that's the, the rules that they are being told to apply. Am I right? Uh, you are right, but there's also the case that those weren't prison officers. That was a private company. Um, the escorting of prisons outside the jail uh, has been privatised. Um, neither the police who took me to the prison nor the prison officers at any stage attempted to handcuff me or restrain me or strip search me. Uh, the only time any of those things were ever attempted on me were attempted by a private company. Uh, and apparently... Uh, the reason for this is because in their private contract, the private company loses so much money for every prisoner which escapes, who escapes. So they therefore uh, insist on manacling everybody, no matter how crazy that is. Now, you're a, you're a kinder, gentler person than me. I, I, I would be, I, I, actually, I am extremely bitter at the justice system that put you through this. How do you feel about it now? Are you angry? Uh, do you seek uh, to continue uh, the campaign or have you turned a leaf uh, and going to go for a quiet life now? Well, um, no, I'm certainly not going to go for a quiet life. I mean, my worry is it can happen to somebody else. Um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not personally angry or bitter because it doesn't help. It you know, doesn't help with in, in judgment on the on, on, on the way going forward. So, um, but my worry is that the judgment enshrines in law the concept uh, that bloggers and mainstream media uh, should be treated differently before a court. The different standards should apply. But a blogger can write something and be jailed for it, and if the mainstream media publishes the same thing, they will not be jailed for it. And that's extraordinary. It says that absolutely in black and white in the judgment. Um, that's very bad. 
and, and this whole idea that anybody who publishes any of the defense case in a trial, in a sexual assault trial, that any extra information you give at all about the case is jigsaw information. There's nothing you can say about the defense that could not in some way help identify who a defendant is, for example, by where the uh, incident took place or when it took place. So um, this uh, use of this extremely nebulous idea of jigsaw identification could be used very easily just to um, uh, jail anyone they want to, in effect, and there's no real defense for it. So, so you know, this is appalling. This has got to be appealed on to eventually to the European Court of Human Rights, because otherwise I won't be the last victim. You know, it, it will happen to other people. So uh, the judgment means that someone like you is uh, a lesser journalist, a lesser writer, uh, with fewer legal protections uh, than a journalist on The Sun or The Daily Star or other paragons of mainstream virtue. And that's now enshrined in law unless this judgment is overturned. Exactly, because the, although it was a court of first instance, it was, strangely enough, the Court of Appeals in Scotland that, that made the judgment with three judges. So that now applies, really, you know, it can be quoted pretty well anywhere in the English-speaking world, uh, and it is a direct legal precedent in all parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and that is exactly what it says. I mean, rather amusingly, it, it says that the, it, it specifically says that the mainstream media are more ethical uh, than <laughs> new media, <laughs> which, um, which comes as I don't know whether to laugh or cry at that idea. Um, finally, and I'm grateful for your time. We, we all love you and we've been with you right from the beginning of this uh, horrific affair. Um, are you in the clear now? Uh, I mean, there's, no, there's nobody watching and taking notes for this that could put you back in trouble? Can you get back in trouble on the same issue or is there double jeopardy uh, uh, preclusion or what? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm now served four months of an eight month sentence and were I to um, uh, say anything that annoys uh, Lady Dorian, then presumably they could stick me back in for the other uh, four months. So um, I shall be careful in what I say about the, um, uh, the case going forward, George. I wanted, incidentally, to remind you, after your, your, your splendid introduction, that, in fact, we, we first met in 1977 in Dundee, wow. where we had buckets and were collecting money for the strikers at the national, at NCR, the NCR strike. Wow. Wow. Well, we are, of course, uh, uh, both uh, Dundonians, and uh, I would like to think uh, two of the most eminent uh, from that uh, fair city. Uh, so uh, there are many reasons that, uh, that we love you and that we felt so badly for you. But I've got to say you're looking well, sounding well. Uh, so maybe, you know, every cloud and all that. Um, I don't know, what was the diet like there? Actually, it wasn't nearly as bad as you might expect. Um, food was, um, it was like school food or hospital food. You, you know, it was uh, shepherd's pie and toad in the hole and those kind of things. But, but and it, it was perfectly edible. Um, I, I didn't mind it at all. And again, I think that's probably because the prison food has not been privatized. Uh, so, so, it's, so it's not too bad. Well, we better uh, wish on that one or uh, we'll be giving them ideas. The Honourable Craig Murray, former British ambassador, political prisoner extraordinaire. I salute you, sir, as do, I'm sure, the vast majority of the audience this evening.